entrepreneurs, business owners, professionals who seek excellence, bringing the business classroom to you. It's the Business Builder Show. Here's Marty Wolf. We still got a long way to go. Yes, we all got a long way to go. Welcome to the Business Builder Show with Marty Wolf. The show for entrepreneurs, business owners, and business leaders. I'm Marty Wolf, your host for the Business Builder Show, and along with my executive producer, D.C. Taylor, we will be your guides on this learning journey. Let me tell you my super objective in being with you today. I want to enthusiastically share stories and information to inspire leaders, that you, by the way, so you can inspire others. My special guest with me today, I think I can call him a friend, is Richard Sheridan. Hi, Richard. How are you, sir? Great to be with you, Marty, and you can absolutely call me a friend. Thank you so much. Um, Richard has written a second book. The first one was called Joy Incorporated, and Rich Sheridan now has a book out called Chief Joy Officer Subtitle says, How Great Leaders Elevate Human Energy and Eliminate Fear. By the way, folks, the foreword to this book was written by none other than Tom Peters. Rich Sheridan, Tom Peters loves your work. Good stuff, huh? He does. He even came to visit Menlo a few weeks ago. It was just awesome to have him here. Oh, wow. That's great. <laughs> that had to be a blast. You know, he is, uh, he's still at it, man. He's getting it done, right? Oh, yeah, he is. He and I are uh, actually uh, bookend keynotes for the AME conference, uh, the Association for Manufacturing Excellence Conference in Chicago in uh, early November. So I'll be the opening keynote and he'll be the closing. So that'll be fun to share a stage with him in that way. Wow, that is extraordinary. Let me do a introduction for Richard Sheridan, or I'm going to call him Rich going forward. Richard Sheridan is CEO, co-founder and chief storyteller of Menlo Innovations, which has won the Alfred P. Sloan Award for Business Excellence in Workplace Flexibility for 11 straight years and five revenue awards from Inc. Magazine. Menlo and Rich have been featured in Inc., Entrepreneur, Forbes, and New York Magazine, and Rich speaks all over the world to some companies that we've heard of, like Mass Mutual, GE, Nike, 3M, and as uh, I don't know if I said it on air or not, but he lives in beautiful Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is also home of another good friend of ours, Ari Weinswake. Right, Rich? Absolutely. Ari's a good friend of mine as well, and uh, I've learned a lot from him. Yeah. All right. Chief Joy Officer, what? how great leaders elevate human energy and eliminate fear. On the inside cover of your book, Rich, it says this. Joy at work seems like a simple idea. Just give everyone whatever they want, right? You say, no. A chief joy officer has to fight joy's greatest enemy, which you say is fear. Tell me more about that, Rich. Well, Marty, I think everybody on the planet these days, uh, whatever business you're in, pursuit of four key uh initiatives, creativity, imagination, innovation, and invention. These are the most human things we can bring to work. And yet fear is the enemy of those things because what fear does is it actually shuts down the part of our brain where all that comes from. Uh, We get into reptile brain. We're now in fight or flight mode. We're not willing to raise our hand in a meeting. We're not willing to speak up when things are troubled because of fear. And if we operate in that mode of fear for too long, we will lose all those other things that we're yearning for, that we're paying the the brightest people on our team to bring. So as a joyful leader, we need to figure out how do we diminish fear? We'll never get rid of all of it. And there's some fears that are actually healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, uh, I often use a metaphor for an airplane of an airplane for uh, comparing uh, the forces that work on an aircraft to the forces that work on a human organization. So there's that lift piece, the lift of human energy, the the weight of bureaucracy, the thrust of purpose and the drag of fear. And if we have we have more human energy, more lift than bureaucracy, if we have more purpose than we have fear, 
our organizational aircraft will get off the ground every single day, and that's what we as joyful leaders want. So somewhat of a sidetrack, but uh, it's a basis to the story. What do you do at Menlo Innovations? What makes you different at Menlo Innovations? Well, what we do is uh, will sound perhaps like a lot of other companies. We are a software design and development firm. Uh, we do contract work for other businesses. But the reason people select us as a partner in their software projects is because of the culture we've created. Mm. In fact, the culture is so interesting. We earn about 15% of our annual revenue just from teaching how our culture works to people who come and visit. We get about 3,000 visitors a year wow. come from all over the world just to see how it all works. Right. And uh, we have a, a crazy, you know, that big, hairy, audacious goal of a mission. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided years ago we wanted to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology and return joy to something that we believed was one of the most unique uh, endeavors of mankind, the design and development of software. I was going to ask this at the end, but I want to I want to ask it now because I want to set the tone. We're going to get deeper into the book. Um, is life at Menlo Innovations all rainbows and unicorns? Because you're talking about joy in the workplace. Is it like, are you sm always smiling? Is everybody happy all the time here at Menlo Innovations? Like, what is this stuff, Rich? You know, I, I, no, uh, I <laughs> no. You, you know, every day hard work here at Menlo. Um, and uh, I sincerely believe if you created a workplace where people were happy every minute of every day, that would actually require some kind of medication. <laughs> Probably. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's real you know, life, right? It, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're real life. We're real people. Uh, we're doing real work. It's hard work, just like everybody else does in the world. And, uh, but what, what we will do is we will gather together as a team and it is truly a team here. Uh, and we can talk about why I can even say that with great confidence. Uh, and we've taken a very different approach. We've, we've turned a lot of things on their head because we didn't want to suffer technologically speaking the way many of us had in our careers, including me. Mm -hmm. uh, I had good 20 years where I did things the standard way. And it, and I can tell you, it just didn't work. And I mm. thought I didn't even want to be in the industry anymore mm. uh, as my career rose and uh, took a big chance, took a risk on a different way of doing things and was customary and it worked. So the book is Chief Joy Officer, How Great Leaders Elevate Human Energy and Eliminate Fear. And my guest again is Rich Sheridan. I suggest you get his first book, too, Joy Incorporated, but you definitely want to get this. So let's get into the book. Rich, talk to me about, I guess I'm saying it right, L's or Ellie's Place, E-L-E-S. Yep. It's in your book. Um, yep. What did you learn from them? I guess it has something to do with the masks we wear. Tell us that story. Yeah, I, I think one of our most finely tuned senses of smells as human beings is a smell for authenticity. And unfortunately, um, as uh, my good friend Stan Slap said in his book, Bury My Heart at Conference Room B, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which is a great title, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he said, most of us actually, especially in middle management, uh, in large corporations, they, we don't actually have a chance to live out our personal values at work. And so we end up being one person at work and a different person at home. And there's almost this living lie culture inside of corporate America where we're not our true selves. And that comes through in, in sometimes terrible ways. And, uh, and I think most terrible for the people who are living that lie uh, at work and they're a different person at home. And, and I think that uh, that causes a lot of uh, issues for mm. people uh, if it's done in a very long time. Yeah, And so the Ellie's Place story I tell in the book uh, was, was telling for me because uh, it gave me a, a different view on how this happens. Ellie's Place is a nonprofit here in Ann Arbor. Uh, they've got a couple of locations in Michigan. And it is specifically set up to help families, particularly families with young children, who are having trouble dealing with the grief of having lost a loved one whether it was a sibling or a parent, uh, here's these young kids in a family and they do not know how to process their emotions. And those kids could be as young as 
three years old or as old as a teenager. And Ellie's place is set up to help them work through these emotions. And uh, we often do lunch and learns here at Menlo. And we invited the team at Ellie's place in because we want to support their mission. And we want to understand more about them. So they came in to explain how they do their work. And uh, one of the things they shared with us uh, was they have this um, exercise they do, particularly with teens, uh, and, and it's a white mask, like a plastic mask you get at a costume party or something like that. Mm-hmm. And on the outside of the mask, they have all the teens write down what they think the world wants to see in them. And so the teens will write down things like, I'm okay now. I, I've moved on. I'm better. I'm happy. Uh, uh, life is good again. And that's what's on the outside of their masks. And then they ask the teens privately to write on the inside of their masks. How are they really feeling? Mm. And they'll write in there, I'm scared. I'm lonely. I miss my dad. Why, God? Why did this happen to me? When will the hurt go away? And then what they have the teens do in this very intimate setting, of course, is turn their masks around and share the inside of their mask with the other teens. And maybe for the first time since the loss of their loved one, they realize how many others share the emotions they share. And that's a moment for them where they begin to understand that these are people who understand me like no one else understands me. Mm. And as I reflected on that particular exercise that day, and I'm getting a little teary eyed just thinking about it. I am too, to be honest uh, with you. (laughs) Go ahead. Go ahead. And um, I realized that this happens in the workplace too, doesn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, especially for leaders, especially for growing leaders, especially for those people who are yearning to climb that corporate ladder. And, you know, there's always going to be a fake it till you make it component of of growth, personal growth. And I think that's okay. But when we start presenting to the world a face of, I got this, I'm confident, I'm secure, we we can move ahead. And if the inside of our mask is, I'm worried, I I don't know what to do next, I I feel incompetent, I I, I need help, but I don't know who to ask. Uh, And we don't share those. Mm-hmm. feelings with others around us, we're going to end up in a really hurtful place yeah. uh, with our teams, with ourselves, with our families. And so I think this idea of bringing your whole self to work, willing to let your guard down enough with your team so they understand you as a leader are also a real human being, maybe with other leaders. And I think a lot of corporations uh, aren't ready for that yet. And they then they suffer the consequences because of it. Wow. No wonder you're chief storyteller at Menlo Innovations. Um, yeah, wonderful story in the book and explained uh, very, very well. Um, it hit, it's hit strong to me also, having lived through that culture. Your story and my story are different industries but are close in similarities. You know, I kind of went through the whole thing. Um, but that really hit home. Okay. Still in the book. Marty, let me, let me share one thing here. Take your time. I get Go. to speak on this topic all over the world now. Go. And here's what I found out, just like what you said. My story is everybody's story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, it is such a common story that when I tell it, I have all these people come up to me and they're like, wow, I felt like you were talking right to me because yep. I've lived the life you've described. And they're nodding their heads as you're speaking, right? And mm-hmm. you can see this affirmation like, Wow. That's why uh, your work at Menlo and, and, the, and the work that you do in your book and, and the tours that you do um, are so, so beneficial. Uh, Rich, uh, how do people get in touch with you and or your website at Menlo? Tell us about that. Yep. Our website is Menlo, M-E-N-L-O, uh, MenloInnovations.com. Mm-hmm. And there you can uh, see what we do, of course. Uh, you can schedule a visit. Uh, you can take a class. Uh, we teach everything we've learned. We decided in our earliest days we were going to share everything we learned with the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not keeping anything a trade secret. Uh, and we're not here to tell people that we have found the one true way. That is not our goal. Right. Uh, we are simply a living, breathing example of a culture that's working. And if people want to finally see an example, because I think we read a lot of books. I was inspired by Tom Peters' book, In Search of Excellence, and others that followed. Mm-hmm. And yet, if you if one day you said, you know what, I just just show me one example of a culture that's working, 
Uh, but typically we don't get that opportunity. And here you do, you get to come in, you get to see it, kick the tires, walk around, see the good and the bad. We're not going to just share the Pollyannish stories of Menlo. Uh, we're going to share the reality. We're going to, we're going to talk about people want to ask us all kinds of questions. I tell them, well, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. Yeah. You can see the whole company here. We'll, we'll show you the, we'll turn the rocks over and look at the bugs crawling underneath if you want. <laughs> well, I maybe shouldn't say this publicly uh, because it'll put me on the spot, but the Business Builder Show is planning a, what we're calling an East to Midwest tour in 2020. Mm-hmm. And uh, you are on my list. And so I'll be reaching out to you soon to say we want to visit and this is what we want to do. Uh, hopefully you'll take my call when I call. <laughs> you know, I, I think you'll find us incredibly approachable, Marty. I'm, I'm sure have. we will. I'm sure we will. Okay, back to the book. Tell me why do you devote an entire chapter to the word humble? Now, maybe there's some clues in what you've already said, but there's an entire chapter, and the title of that chapter is Humble. Tell me more. Well, I think, you know, if you, if you think about the challenge of leadership, uh, and how we, how many of us got there. And this is certainly true for me. Um, typically we get elevated into leadership because ultimately those above us saw us performing as what I would call the smartest guy or the smartest gal in the room. Mm. And we kind of elbowed our way to the front of the class, uh, by being anything but humble. Mm-hmm. And yet a true leader is a servant leader. A true leader is somebody who says, I am the least important person in this room. My job is to help everyone around me succeed. And until we come to grips with that kind of humility, uh, we will be a leader that not many people will follow. Uh, They will follow maybe in name only. Uh, We might hear somebody say, yep, I'm right behind you, boss. Mm. Five miles behind you, but I'm (laughs) behind you. (laughs) I can't see you anymore. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I can't wait for you to fail. Um, So I can step up into your position. But uh, so I think this idea of servant leadership is just huge. Yeah. And so uh, I think all of us as leaders have to find that way to serve others. And some of those things can be very simple. Uh, I can tell you some of my best conversations with the team uh, occur in the morning when I'm helping make the first pot of coffee and emptying the dishwasher alongside of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and I always tell the team, you know, because uh, sometimes they'll ask, they'll see me doing stuff that they're like, oh, that doesn't seem like CEO work to me. And I tell them, I say, look, I'm not going to ask you guys to do anything I'm not willing to do myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and I think you got to live that as well in front of them because they need to see that part of you. So you become more real to them and you become more approachable. Mm-hmm. People want to work in this kind of environment. They don't want to be humbled themselves. They want mm-hmm. to um, share the journey with the leader, and they want to have purpose in what they do. Am I accurate in that statement? Yeah, and, I, and boy, uh, you, you said something. I wanted just you actually caught my attention with it. There's a big difference between being a humble leader and humbling others. That's almost the opposite of being a humble leader, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's interesting that the same word can be used in both contexts mm-hmm. because the, the humbling of others feels a lot like fear-based management, right? I'm going to show you how smart I am, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, and, um, yeah, there's no question that people want to work in a place where they feel valued. They feel like there is a sense of purpose uh, because purpose is what pulls us through. Uh, you know, when I talk about joy, this long arc of joy, um, predominantly what I do when I talk about the purpose part of joy is ask people who come and visit two seemingly simple questions that aren't as easy to answer as you might first think. And the questions are, who do you serve and what would delight look like for them? Mm. And to me, that goes to the heart of purpose of an organization. I think we are, as human beings, we are wired for three things. We are wired to serve others. We are wired to work in community with others. And we are wired to work and we're wired to work hard. Mm -hmm. And if we're working hard on something that's so meaningful that it's going to give others delight, we will fight through all kinds of battles. We will fight through all kinds of Mm -hmm. struggle. Uh, in order to provide that kind of purposeful outcome 
for the world we serve. And here's the interesting question for your listeners to contemplate. When you think about who you serve, I'm going to take three obvious stakeholders off the table. To get to servant leadership as a company, as an organization, I'm going to take your customers off the table. I'm going to take your employees off the table. And I'm going to take your investors off the table. It doesn't mean you shouldn't serve all three of them. Of course you should. Serve your customers, that's where your revenue comes from. Serve your employees, that's who does the work and does the quality work. Serve your investors, that's where your capital comes from in order to expand. Of course you have to serve them, but serving them is still self-serving. When we think about serving others, and there are so many examples that I can come up with in this, but my favorite is we had a life insurance company here, a big one. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. And I challenged them with this question. And their immediate answer, the obvious one is, we serve our policyholders. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I get it. I get it. But I'm pretty sure when your product is most useful, your policyholder is passed on. Mm. And all of a sudden, you can see the look in their eyes. They're like, oh, yeah, we actually serve the beneficiaries. Mm. Beneficiaries are people who don't know who this life insurance company is until the moment of truth. They, they've never paid them a dime. And when they call, though, what are they expecting? They're spent expecting empathy and compassion and understanding, maybe a shoulder to cry on, maybe someone who's willing to listen to the life story of the loved one who who cared enough about this person to create a life insurance policy to take care of them uh, when they passed on. And in this moment, one of their team members, a woman in the class, there was a tear rolling down her face. And I said, what's going on? And she said, well, we just outsourced our claims department to an offshore firm with the specific instructions, prevent fraud. So that person you're talking about, Rich, we're first going to treat like a criminal before we ever get around mm. any empathy and stuff. Wow. Wow. That's page 80 of Chief Joy Officer, How Great Leaders Elevate Human Energy and Eliminate Fear by Rich Sheridan. Part two of the book, uh, Rich, oh, we, could go, we could go on for hours, but part two of the book is about uh, building, a, building a culture of joyful leadership. Talk to me about this. Uh, I guess it's a quote right out of the book. I'm not sure. But I wrote down, if you want a culture of leaders, build a culture of systems thinkers. Mm -hmm. Now, you think of systems thinkers, and maybe the word joy and systems thinkers maybe does not connect. So connect that for me. (laughs) Okay, Rich? Yeah, let me go back to the airplane metaphor just for a second. Um, You know, if you've ever been on a commercial flight and that plane shakes in the air because of turbulence and your stomach jumps into your throat and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the plane maybe dropped a couple hundred feet and that sort of thing. And, you know, your first thought as a passenger, if you don't know how airplanes work, is, oh, thank God we have a competent pilot to get us through this kind of tough time. But in fact, what you learn is the actual design of the aircraft system itself is designed to auto-correct. It's called positive stability in the aircraft design. So those wings tipped up just a little bit actually create a positive stability. So when the plane is buffeted about, it will self-correct and get back to straight and level flight with no human intervention. That is systems thinking at its best because what that means is when the plane is flying and something like that happens, we aren't distracting the pilot with the minutia they can actually still say to ourselves, are we still safe? Are we getting to the destination? Are the people in the plane still comfortable and secure? That sort of thing. So Mm -hmm. they can deal with the bigger issues while the little issues are being taken care of by the systems around you. As joyful leaders, we should think about the systems inside of our organization and consider how can we design systems Mm -hmm. that take care of the minutia so that the leaders can actually concentrate on things we actually need the humans for. Mm. And so we're, we have systems going on everywhere here at Menlo. And the way I differentiate this for uh, a lot of people is there are literally kind of those two kinds of organizations in the world, ones that are built on the backs and shoulders of heroes and the other ones that are developed by systems thinkers. Mm-hmm. Hero-based organizations can't scale unless you scale the heroes, and that's usually with overtime, and it burns people out and gets them frustrated. And, and, uh, and, but systems thinkers will ask when something goes wrong, not who did this, whose fault is this, but how did our systems let us down to allow this to happen? And in that way, if we continue thinking like systems thinkers in our organizations, 
we can fly to heights and distances that were previously unimaginable. So this is how you focus on becoming great leaders that elevate human energy and eliminate fear. So my guest has been Rich Sheridan. His book, again, is Chief Joy Officer. I do suggest you read his first book, which is Joy Incorporated. His company is Menlo Innovations. Uh, You can schedule tours. Go to their website, menloinnovations.com. Correct, Rich? Yes. And you can see all the great things that they're doing. Go to Ann Arbor, Michigan. It is a beautiful place. Have a great sandwich um, before or after you visit Rich at uh, Zingerman's Deli. I highly suggest that also. So, Rich, would you would do it. When I get out there, Absolutely. we're going to spend some time together there. Um, I like it. So let's wrap up. Couldn't possibly cover everything in the book, but is there something you want to leave us with, something maybe I didn't ask you or that you want to drive home a point or two? It's, uh, it's your mic, man. You know, I, I think one of the things I have seen is uh, big corporations take – uh, make a major change in direction on a simple admonition, which is run the experiment. If, if we can simply move leaders to an idea of action orientation versus contemplation, if somebody has a new idea and doesn't get shot down in the moment, and, and if the response isn't, well, let's form a committee to write a policy on your new idea, rather mm-hmm. than let's run the experiment. Let's try and see what happens and decide whether it worked or didn't. You can make big changes quickly with that simple attitude of, you know what, I don't know if it'll work, but let's run the experiment. Let's see what happens. And I'll tell you, we have great stories. I've shared some in the book. We have stories here at Menlo and stories that I was able to tell in the book because of big changes at companies as large as Mass Mutual mm-hmm. and General Electric Corporation mm-hmm. based on that simple admonition, let's run the experiment. Let's try stuff and see what happens. And so my encouragement to your lead to your listeners is become a leader who is more inclined to take action than to take a meeting. Say that again. (laughs) Become a leader who is more inclined to take action than take a meeting. We'll close right there because I don't think I can top that. (laughs) Richard Sheridan, author of Chief Joy Officer, How Great Leaders Elevate Human Energy and Eliminate Fear. Rich, um, I'm grateful that you allowed me to be a friend. You said at the beginning of the show, you're doing great work. Thank you so much for being part of the Business Builders Show. Marty, thanks for uh, thanks for helping me spread the joy. You got it, man. Thank you so much for listening to the Business Builders Show. To learn more about me, and I'm Marty Wolf, go to MartyWolfBusinessSolutions.com. That's MartyWolfBusinessSolutions.com. To learn more about Kelly Hoey, go to her website, which is jkellyhoey.co. That's jkellyhoey.co. And of course, you can find Kelly and Marty on LinkedIn and Twitter. A reminder, you can find all our Business Builders shows on iTunes, Spotify, and on your favorite podcast app. Bringing the business classroom to you. It's the Business Builders Show with Marty Wolf. 